Hello and welcome to the Ready to Bloom podcast with your host Holly Wharton. Ready to Bloom helps heart-centered women entrepreneurs to overcome their fears, blocks and limiting beliefs so they can be more successful in business. As a heart-centered business owner, you do amazing work. Holly's mission in life is to help you help more people. Help us help more women in business with a quick review of this podcast. It just takes a minute to leave one today over at iTunes. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more we can help women in business. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Ready to Bloom podcast, episode 89. This is your host, Holly Wharton. I'm here with today's special guest, Victoria Dresner from Batik Walla. Victoria is a self-taught Batik artist who has built a successful business around her art. Welcome, Victoria. Hi, Holly. How are you doing today? <laughs> good. <laughs> good, good. Well, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today with your art and your business. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, it's a long, long story because I have been doing this for a long time, actually. I am self-taught. I taught myself how to do this as a, as a teenager, actually. I actually, I, I migrated out to the West Coast from the East Coast, mm-hmm. pretty young, on my own, and uh, I was, you know, curious about batik. I, I came out here with like this draw to the whole Grateful Dead era and like the the festivals, and I just had this idea of of what was going on out here. And when I came out here, I you know I I, I went to the craft fairs and I was expecting to see this amazing batik mm-hmm. and tie dye, and I just I just had this uh, anticipation for it. But there wasn't the batik that I. I, you know, I, I went and I was a little bit like, what, what's going on? This isn't, this wasn't what I expected. And so I decided I was going to learn how to teach myself. I mean, I was familiar with it and I just, you know, I was on its adventure. And anyway, I had the time and the space to do it. And I, I checked some books out at the library and put together the supplies just from like a little bit from the art store, a little bit from the Goodwill or uh, thrift stores, and I just started experimenting with it. And the first, the first batik I ever made, the first time I I painted wax onto fiber, I knew, I knew, I just it's just something turned, something switched for me in life, and wow. I I just felt like. I knew it was my calling. Like, I just, it was like the answer. Like, this was the direction for me. It was just pure joy. Hmm. Now, had you, sorry, had you experimented with other art forms before? Was this your first kind of creation of art? Yeah, I had painted, you know, I dabbled in and out of, of art stuff all my, you know, in my younger years. But I just wasn't really in a situation to pursue it. I, I mean, I, I did try to go to school. I tried to go to college, and it just it didn't click. I couldn't, I could not, I just didn't feel like I fit in. And I wound up wandering around. <laughs> <laughs> Until you I found mean, your batik. <laughs> that's a crazy story. I, and so I, I saw, you know, I'm, I made these batiks. I took them to a little craft fair. I laid them out on a on a blanket for five dollars. It was a Sunday afternoon. I just I got a ride. I hitchhiked to like this local craft. Well, local. I mean, Oregon. It was three hours away oh, wow. in the mountains, out in the middle of nowhere. And I laid the blanket out with my thrift store T-shirts that I had just batiked. But they were, you know, they were just so precious. And I sold. I sold them all. Wow. I sold them all, like right away. And. uh I was shocked. I mean, I was still a teenager at this point, and I had only had these like s- strange jobs, you know, like chopping up fish heads and stuff at like <laughs> these little fish shops on the uh, on the East Coast. So, you know, I made a hundred dollars in one day. Wow! And I was so so blown away. I couldn't believe it. I remember, uh, you know, like putting uh, at the end of the day, I just, I had all the little crumpled up bills and change, you know, <laughs> just left over from what I made, you know, made that day after all the expenses. And it was like $87 or something. It was just, I just, it blew my mind. I was, and it was like, I did, there was no going back for me. 
like for me at that time, it just seemed like the most money I'd, I'd ever made. <laughs> like mm. I was just amazed that I could make that much doing something that I really liked doing. And and yeah, so that was the start. So so instantly when you first started creating these boutiques, you knew that was your thing. And then the first day you went to sell your first boutiques, you sold everything. That's just such amazing confirmation from the world that this is your thing and this is what you need to be doing. Yeah, it was. It was the start, you know. It was the start. It was really it was it was like the direct like I I got on a conveyor belt or I mean I, that's like not the exact analogy I want to use but like I think I just sort of didn't know what I wanted to do. I had tried to be like, you know, to conform to what I I guess society expects young people to do, but I just couldn't do it. Like it just didn't feel right for me. So when I did the art and I was actually able to turn it into, you know, currency, that was it. I mean, there's no going back. So I just put more and more into, you know, the business. It, I, you know, essentially that was me starting a business. Yeah. I was like 19, 18 years old or something. Yeah. I got, I put, you know, I bought more materials and supplies and I made them a little nicer and started selling them at the local craft fair. And, you know, I, I really, I started to like actually make some money <laughs> as a kid. It was great. And then what happened was I, I got involved with, I got married basically mm. to this like crazy wild Rastafarian dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, you know, it was interesting. He was an interesting character. And uh, it was, we traveled, we just, you know, it was just, we were such a strange couple. <laughs> yeah, such a strange story. I, and I, you know, we had three children together. Mm -hmm. Young, I was super young, but I was painting, I was making batiks this whole time uh, to support us, basically, really. I mean, I guess he kind of came in, we, we were both doing it for a while, but it was really my thing. But he, I mean, he, we were married, so it just seemed like that's what, what was going on for a while. But you know, by, gosh, a few years into it, like, the, it just, it was an abusive relationship. I'll just say it like it is. And I left. I had to leave. And I did. You know, at by 25 years old, I had three children. I was divorced. Mm -hmm. And I was self-employed, a self-employed artist doing craft, you know, these little local craft fair markets to support us. But because I had already been doing the art and the boutique and, you know, I knew I could. I knew I could keep going. And I actually felt like I could probably do it better not being in, you know, having that, it was just not. Yeah, the negativity. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, bear with, it, it's a long story. So I'm 25, and it, honestly, it just, I kind of, you know, tumbled around for a, a long time, just struggling, really, I guess. You know, I don't want to say, like, and you know, I don't want to be too much of a downer, because actually this story turns around quite a bit. But decades, decades of... Yeah, you know, looking for a good relationship, not, you know, finding myself in bad situations, just unhealthy, you know, situations. I mean, compared to now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I stayed, I, but I stayed to, true to the art. It was really the thing that, it was the one thing that kept me going, that kept us all going. You know, I supported my, my kids with this. And I worked hard. And I, you know, the business was, it was like a part of me. It was, it was like part of the family. It was like not something that was something I would, co could compromise or would compromise. And honestly, it's, it's a great thing because I think that really saved, you know, saved my life. I, really, I suppose, if you want a, a big picture. I mean, yeah, so you know, I struggled, but I worked hard and I, I studied business uh, and I, I tried to be smart about what I was doing. And uh, I went from craft fairs to festivals. I did like larger music festivals, larger craft fairs. And, you know, I, but I can't say I was totally happy doing that. I just, I think I was in a rut. I was stuck or I, I didn't really know my choices or 
was kind of in a fog, still in the uh, under the cover of abusive relationships, mm-hmm. really. I, I mean, that that's just the truth. I don't really talk about it too much because I think it's, you know, it's a sensitive topic. But it is the truth. And I can say that now, you know, in, in full power because there was a point in my life uh, when it just got to the so bad, I want to say. You know what? Yeah, it was just a series of events. And it was me watching my business struggle that I made some really drastic changes. And those changes have sparked off a turnaround that is so amazing. And I'm in it right now. It's I'm on the climb. And I am so amazed. I'm so blessed. And I, and I feel... I feel lucky that I got to this point. I'm just so excited about <laughs> things, you know, in life and how it's turned around. It just, I can't, I just can't even express how wonderful. I, I want to say luck, but it, mm. it's been a lot of hard times to get to this point. Mm. I don't know what, if it's luck. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of different things at play there. So what were the changes that you made that brought this situation around? Well, I'll tie into that. I'm going to, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the business strategy and how that brought me to the point where I was able to make the, op- the necessary observations that led me to the, the journey of, you know, es- getting out of sc- escaping or like rising up out of the sort of victim role in that I was, you know, stuck in. Uh, there was a point where I decided to, or I was encouraged, but Ed- Etsy came along. And so I had been doing festivals and I had I knew that it was time to get a website. It was so complicated trying to build a WordPress site. I couldn't do it and you know, festivals are a lot of work. So I just didn't have that capacity to build a WordPress site. Anyway, Etsy came along, you know, and folks kept saying, "Oh, you got to get on Etsy. Check out Etsy." So I did. I it was like, yeah, January or 2008, I think 2007. And I set up an Etsy shop and it was so easy to do. And I, I sold, I sold something right away. It was, it, I knew this was a, a good thing because as far as the, um, batik, the, uh, the category of batik specifically, there really wasn't much competition on Etsy. Mm-hmm. So I kind of felt that was my in and it was, uh, so I, you know, I got right in there and I just, uh, you know, I, I started selling a few things right away. I was pretty impressed with it and, uh, I just kept at it, but I, of course the festivals were the main, um, source of income. And, but I, what I happened was over the years, one year and then two years and three years, I noticed that my Etsy sales were increasing gradually without any effort on my part as far as uh, like advertising or, you know, like strategy marketing, just me listing items and, you know, maintaining the Etsy shop. My sales were growing substantially compared to the income that was coming in from the festivals, which were, which were pretty much the same. I could pretty much predict what a festival, you know, what a weekend at a certain event, what it was going to be like, just be- because I'd been doing it for so many years. And I, so I was watching the natural growth of online sales and comparing that to a lot of the variables that I knew festivals and doing festivals were actually, there's a lot of risk to it as mm-hmm. far as having a steady income. And uh, what happened was, I I was in I was in just another relationship that was just not it wasn't just another unhealthy relationship and um you know, nothing too serious. I never remarried after that, but I I always like, you know, was looking and hoping and all that kind of thing. So, um my sales were suffering online. It was just so bad the experiences that I was having in in my real life were having such a negative impact on my self-esteem and my uh, just the way I could carrying myself, projecting myself, and, and how I felt about my business that my sales were suffering. I just wasn't putting myself into it the way I knew I could. 
and just the way I knew that, you know, people love batik and there was a disconnect. And for me, it was so important, you know, my love for, for batik, for what I do is so strong that, and I also, you know, I will have to say that my family, my children too, I would say they're all <laughs> in it together, <laughs> uh, but just we'll, we'll stay on the business and technical side that just to see my say, my online sales suffer yet knowing what I knew, uh, as far as like uh, how the internet is going to is like how important it is for mm-hmm. us as a society to interact and to purchase and to how enmeshed in it is in our in our lives and then you know seeing how for me i just felt it was an unnatural thing to to see my sales suffer so i just just something just clicked inside of me something just said it's time to you got to figure this out, Victoria. This isn't right. Like it's it's not just a lightweight little dating game anymore. This is serious. It's really affecting your life. And I so yeah, I started researching how to recover from emotional abuse. Mm-hmm. That was the <laughs> I mean, it's kind of in, you know, it's kind of intense, but it's mm. it's true. It's serious. Uh that was the those were the words I typed in something about yeah to really start to dive in and 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 get into the underlying causes for the struggles i was having with my business my personal life my my self um worth i guess the word mm-hmm. is or yeah well, it's all yeah. interrelated i mean if you're suffering emotional distress on a personal level then of course your business is going to be affected as well yes 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 i absolutely and I, for the longest time, I thought I could keep it separate, or mm-hmm. I was keeping it separate. <laughs> you know, I, it's all compartmentalized, except it's not. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. For the longest time, I, I didn't really take that as seriously as, as I do now. Once I started really educating myself about abusive relationships. Uh, and emotional abuse, of, of verbal abuse, you know, domestic violence. Once I really started to educate myself about those things, I under, I, it was like I realized what was happening. And I didn't before. I mean, I really didn't. And, you know, I, I'm not going to – I just – when you don't know, you don't know, mm. you know. And it's like unless you learn – and figure it out for yourself, you know, what can you, you know, how can you blame yourself mm. for, for not knowing, you know, I just didn't have that vantage point yeah. until I made the in, intentional, you know, effort to educate myself on what it was. And I am so glad I did. I mean, because at the time, you know, I just, I, when women who are involved in you know, I mean, this, this is, I just really haven't talked about this too much, but it's, it's very, it's really a real thing. It was for me and it really affected my life for many years. And, you know, this is my story and I'm just going to, you know, just put it out there. But women who, from my, from what I went through, women who are involved in emotionally abusive relationships often don't know it. Yeah. And they don't realize it. They and they they won't. They were not really acknowledging it. And um, for me, a men, much of it has to do with the fact your entire environment and surroundings are reinforcing your position of ignorance. Mm-hmm. And that these were all things I needed to learn, and I did. And when I realized what was going on, I changed my life big time. I mean. I had to redo every, I, I stopped doing festivals. I just, there were a lot of reasons uh, that, you know, just f- for festivals, you know, a lot of dynamics with having repeat festivals over and over year after year to the same locations. There was just a bad element coming into play and that needed to end. So I, you know, for better or for worse, I looked at my online stats and I looked at the situations with the festivals and even though my online situation wasn't as robust as 
you know, as in it needed to be, or, you know, it was, I knew that I could just eke out a living if I just focused to my, you know, on, to my online sales and stopped going to the festivals. And I felt that just by not exposing myself to uh, that a certain type of negativity that was happening, mm -hmm. you know, that it was worth it was worth cutting my cost of living down mm -hmm. just to live off what I could online. So it was a leap of faith. It's a huge leap of faith, especially with three <laughs> children. I mean, doing it on your own, that's still a big thing. But that's that's fantastic that you were, you know, had the guts to just step out and do that because you felt right to you. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I have, four, I have four sons, actually. Oh, wow. Yes, I did have a... Um, a renegade love child <laughs> back, <laughs> back in uh, 2007. And that is actually why I started on Etsy because I was, you know, I was pregnant and it was hard to do festivals. And, uh, you know, as much as I had wished it had worked out with that relationship, it didn't. And so I, I had to, it was sort of like, you know, you have to get online. You have to figure this out. It's funny how every time I've made a very successful, it, it was sort of, you know, move. It was sort of like, because I had to do it, you yeah. know, there's really no other alternative. But I mean, the payoff has been amazing. So I, yeah, so my, we, there's a huge age difference between my children. I have a, <laughs> my older children are in college and then I have a second grader right now. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> He's precious. It's great. So yes, now I'm, yes, I'm supporting, well, I'm not, anyway, I'm supporting, well, one, my oldest is on, on his own, but then I have two in college and mm -hmm. they're, I'm still, they're still at home and then I have the second grader and a house. Yes, mm -hmm. I've worked my butt off. I've gotten <laughs> <laughs> to this point. Well, anyway, here, I'll just go, go into the online thing. I started, uh, yeah, I, t I just, it was a leap of faith. And I went into, I just decided, I was like, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to, I, I cleaned up my social life and I, I ended the relationship. Unfortunately, that's just how it had to be. And um, I did big time changes. I mean, I blocked phone numbers. Hmm. I got rid of like hundreds and hundreds of contacts and not out of malice. It wasn't. This wasn't because I was hating people or any of that. I really just needed to start over. Mm. You know, I needed. Yourself. Well, I had to protect myself from the main problems, mm -hmm. and that really came down to you know some of the elements at festivals and just a, a few specific people. But when it came to like deleting all the contacts and all the Facebook friends and all that stuff. I mean, these, these weren't close people. I mean, I, I, we're talking hundreds, hundreds. Wow. I spent days just delete, delete, delete. Because I needed to change my environment. I had to change the, the input coming mm -hmm. into my, my peripheral. What I was reading, what I was watching, what I was, even the music I was listening to. I had to change it all. I changed my diet. Uh, I started exercising. You know, and I also became very sensitive to right and wrong and my and listening to my instincts, you know, is this person and I mean it wasn't easy at first and I definitely struggled. I went even right after I stopped doing festivals, I I hired a um a local website builder guy and he was kind of a a slimy guy. He <laughs> he took he took the payment, never built the site. And, you know, I, I was, this was right when I had just started to make this transition in my life. And I had a, a weird feeling about him, but I, I wasn't quite, you know, I didn't really have a grasp on it. But it was interesting because I knew that I was capable of, of starting to, you know, call whether or not somebody had bad intentions or not. And I, I was able to make that decision fairly early before I lost too much money with him. But I, once I realized that that was no good, I moved on quickly to something else. And that's when I discovered Shopify. Mm -hmm. And I just decided I was going to have to, you know, take it into my own hands. And I saw all these great Shopify sites through Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And I decided to learn how to use uh, Shopify. 
This is just months right after I think the last festival I did. Wow. And Shopify had a tutorial about how to set up your store and how to market. And in, in their tutorial, they start uh, described Facebook marketing. And right at the same time, I, you know, I started to pay more attention to marketing gurus on, on Twitter and Facebook. And, you know, my, my world opened up. I didn't have as much negativity, you know, coming in, distracting me all the time. You know, and I had no contacts, you know, so I wasn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't really have any social interaction going on. So I started to put way a lot more attention into my business and selling online. It just happened that way. You know, it was, it wasn't, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to stop, you know, talking to, you know, I'm just going to stop socializing with everything that's familiar and just focus on the internet. I don't know, maybe it was intentional. (laughs) (laughs) But what I stumbled into was actually amazing. Like I had no idea how what a you know beneficial impact that that decision would make. Uh, yeah. So I started I started to uh, you know getting into a little bit of Facebook marketing, uh, the concept of selling your artwork online or selling anything online, really. But I'm an artist at heart. Mm-hmm. So I, um, everything I learned, I translated it into how can I sell my artwork online using these tools or these techniques or, you know, the, through the messages that I'm learning through, you know, YouTube and just a, all, wherever I could find information about marketing, I would read it. And I mean, it wasn't exclusive to any particular, it was all the best, all the best. I, I was as much YouTube and uh, blog posts and everything else, Facebook groups that I could get into and just read, learn, watch podcasts. Yeah. I mean, I can't even tell you how many podcasts I've listened to while I paint <laughs> on marketing and business and uh, even just the psychology of of marketing or the psychology of people online and how they're interacting with each other. I would also study artists. It's been fun. It's been amazing. It's, I'm, it's, it's wonderful. It's like almost as fun as it was when I learned how to batik. Wow. Well, it sounds <laughs> like you've given yourself a huge education. What would you say for, you know, a new artist who wanted to start kind of moving to the online world? What would be your top tips on how they could build their online business from their artwork? Ooh, wow. Top tips. Gosh, like, uh, there's so many different, gosh, I don't know. That's, that's so broad, but how should we narrow that down? Well, what's worked best for you? Cause you've got fantastic videos. I, you know, I don't know what is, what are kind of the top three things that have kind of most contributed to building your online business? Yeah. Video is huge. And even though I, I started doing videos a couple years ago, I can't even remember why I did it. I just knew that because of all my experience selling at festivals. Now, I used to love selling at festivals. And I actually loved festivals. I love the travel and the people. And it's, just so, it's just so cool. There's just some specific stuff that, you know, you know, time just changes. So I had all the experience of selling to people in a, you know, in like a highly stimulating environment one-on-one. And I felt like video, now that we're on the internet, you know, we're online, video would be, is the way for me to keep doing that. Like I could still be the person, the artist selling her artwork and, but I would just do it with a video as opposed to just being in my booth, yeah. <laughs> having traveled hundreds <laughs> and hundreds of miles. And that's kind of how I, I took it. You know, that's what I did. Through a lot of the things that I studied about, uh, you know, online growth and just the way uh, the Internet's changing the world, I felt strongly that video was, is important for communicating to people. You know, they... And also as a shopper looking, you know, wanting to purchase like cool stuff, I, it helps to see it, you know, through like in a video, three dimensional or, you know, actually see, you know, see the fabric stretch and that kind of thing or the thickness of the fabric. There's just so many details that video provides Mm -hmm. for 
a shopping experience that, you know, why not offer that? That just seems like such a, such a great idea. Like I, I would feel more comfortable about purchasing something if I, if someone had a video and they, they we, I could see a different perspectives or what it looked like in motion. Video to me, it's just, it's just amazing. I, it's the answer. It's like the, <laughs> I love it. I've actually started to put a little bit more energy into my YouTube channel as a channel itself, as well as Facebook. Yeah. Because yeah. I do put a lot of energy into Facebook. And I think the great things about your videos are that not only are you presenting your products and showing your products on video, but you're also talking about your work and people are getting to know you as an artist. And I think that adds such an important element to any business that, you know, creates art. Yeah, that does. I mean, part of it is my need for expression. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know why I need to vlog, but I do. And I just think it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a social dynamic. You know, it's a, it's a way to like, um, a social dynamic, I want to say. It's a way to connect with people. Uh, you know, it's, it's through, you know, this <laughs> mechanical source, but it's still a connection. And I, I like it. It's a calling. It, I feel like it's my intuition telling me to do it. So it is, it's important to me. I mean, another one of the reasons I started the you with YouTube, you can actually take your embedded videos and uh, attach the video to a product in a Shopify site. Mm. So I learned how to do that, that and that made a big difference for I thought it would like really make my boutiques, you know, really send the message to what it, the boutiques are about. I mean, in the big picture, I I think boutique is under appreci I don't want to say underappreciated, but not really well recognized. Not a whole lot of people know what boutique is. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask you. You kind of alluded to it at the beginning, but can you tell us a little bit more for our listeners who may not know what boutique is? What are the kinds of products that you sell? Because it's a very, very time-consuming, intricate, very yeah. process. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what Batique is and what types of products you create or artwork products. <laughs> okay, Batique. It is. It's a way of making a fabric design with a, using wax as a resist and and layers of dye in between uh, these wax painting. Gosh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, right. So you're taking so you're taking an article of clothing or a piece of fabric and you're painting the wax onto it so that when you dye the fabric, the dye doesn't get those parts. Exactly. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, you got it. That's, That's a non technical description. <laughs> artists, fiber artists, much of the craft industry, you know, the industry are all very familiar with fatigue and appreciate it. Mm. Like I'm infatuated with it. I love it. I love it. I always have loved it. I, you know, I, I found out about it in books when I was a kid, a little kid, and I just always had some sort of a fascination with it. But I didn't really try it until I moved out west, and I had the, you know, the time to and space to to just experiment with these like crazy craft projects. So that was the first one I got into. That or was it? I don't remember, but it, it was the one that when I, when I did it, it made the biggest impact. It was life-changing, yeah. absolutely life-changing. So what you create, you create um, hoodies, you have yoga pants, you've got tops, yeah. you've got dresses, you've got your new boy short. Yeah, they, well, I have different, I've been doing clothing, uh, yeah, the whole time. I like doing the clothes, I like making batik clothing because you can, do things with the designs as far as placing the designs on different parts of the body, how the clothing would be worn, that there's really no other way to create those um, details, like having rays and swirls go over the shoulder mm -hmm. or under the arm and around the back or, you know, in the center and then having it come out and around and just finding details on the body, I mean, I, I see it as painting a body, you know, when I'm doing the clothing. There's really no other way to to do it. 
and then I found it. I, I don't know. I, I started with boutique and I never, I never strayed. <laughs> I had the same method since the beginning, since, since the very absolute beginning. I remember there were times where in the beginning I t- experimented it with a little bit of paraffin mm. because, you know, people usually say, oh, yeah, you got to use paraffin for this and that. But no, I, I could not use paraffin. I, I won't get near the stuff. I just, the fumes, mm. I learned early. No, it's, it's just pure beeswax and painting this, you know, each piece and hand dyeing each piece and doing the whole process by hand. And I just I'm I work hard and I I'm fast. I I do plan out my designs. I plan out the clothing. Uh, usually, like a month in advance, I'll have an idea of what the new type of clothing is going to be. I, the page has grown so quickly in the past year that I'm still kind of getting my bearings <laughs> on how to do this. So, uh, but what what's been going well lately is I'll come up with an an item that that will be the item for the next sale uh, that I'll make in a batch. And so I'll make, you know, as many as I can between 20 and 50. So, you know, so far I've been able to put together that many. Well, hoodies, hoodies are pretty intense. They're, they're a lot, they're like huge, heavy, big (laughs) pieces of clothing. (laughs) So I can usually only get 20 to 30 of those when I do a batch. But like the little boy shirt undies, I had 50 pieces wow. and they, oh, they went so fast. I'm going to do another batch of those. I'm going to try to make even more if I can next time. And just so, you know, they don't sell out so quickly or if they do sell out that more people will have access to them. Hmm. But yeah, we did. I just did leotards last month or actually earlier this month. And then I have tank tops. We're going to do a tank top thing. And then also planning on doing dresses. But the dresses are also elaborate. So they're going to take a little while for me to get enough together to have like a big push sale. And then I do the yoga pants as custom. I haven't done like a big yoga pants sale. The, the custom sales come in. And that's when um, those are I make specifically for, for a person who orders them. And then there's just a choice of colors that I offer, colors and designs. And I'll get the order and I'll start creating the batik design on, on the, the item, either the yoga pants or the, the hoodies right now. That's mm. what I've got pretty much. And, uh, and, yeah, so the custom stuff is just steady and available right now to you know on the site that any anyone can order at any time and then the the ready to ship items are the ones that I put together in a batch and prepare for the public and then they're all out there and those are just ready to ship ready to go no customizing or any of that kind of thing that just you see it and you get it (laughs) and it's fun it's it's going well I like it Right. And that way I can still be creative and create what I want to, you know, what my imagination is calling me to do and, uh, and what I think might be a neat design. And, and I'm, 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 it's not just all custom orders based off of, you know, a few select things. But at the same time, I still can do custom orders for people right now so that that choice is there at this point. <laughs> mm, great. So Victoria, where can people find you online so they can check out your artwork and, and buy some of your fantastic clothing? <laughs> I'm at batikwalla.com mm-hmm. and uh, that's my website. I'm also on Etsy at batikwalla.etsy.com and uh, my Facebook page is pretty active. Gosh, ba- Batik, uh, <laughs> Batikwalla by Victoria Dresner. Mm-hmm. And and then there's also the YouTube channel, Batik Walla. And those are pretty much my main things that I, I do. You have a fantastic right following on Facebook. How, how Was there a point, kind of like a tipping point, where that just kind of took off and exploded? Or was that a gradual kind of organic Yeah, growth? well, it's been gradual over the year. And I built, yeah, I, I mean, I worked at it. <laughs> mm. Although... I have to say, yeah, it's getting big. The The fan base is really growing. And 
sometimes it's, I get, I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> it's kind of like, I wasn't expecting all this. Uh, you know, I see it as a responsibility to maintain. So I, I'm going to, hmm. and yeah. And, uh, but it, it it can be fun too. You know, it's, it, there are a lot of people, there's just a lot, just being online is wonderful. It really is. It's, it's just fantastic. It's really, I feel like the answer for my artwork and style of artwork and the, the way I express my creativity, selling, being online, it's like, it was, it's like a blessing, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky that things have, you know, turned out this way. I'm glad. I, I feel like batik and the internet and my style of batik work together really well. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Funny little combination. Mm. But yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, I loved hearing your story and I love how, you know, you found your thing and you went with your gut feeling and it's, it's worked out so well for you. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, thank you so much for listening today. And remember to visit readytobloom.com forward slash 89 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Ready to Bloom podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to head over to iTunes and leave us a quick review of this podcast. Thank you.